Welcome to Face to Face. This is a show about change and what's next. It's a show that asks questions and peels back the layers of our average everyday experience and goes beyond scratching the surface. We interview people doing incredible things who are making a difference around the globe. Join me as we listen in and get one step closer to understanding that big ideas shared create collaboration. Collaboration can inspire community and communities create social change. I'm David Peck and this is Face to Face. So Peter Enns has written a book, uh, well he's written several books I guess, but he's written a book called The Bible Tells Me So. And once again, like uh, one of my uh, other podcasts uh, recently, uh, in interviews I did with a guy by the name of Derek Flood, he's talking about hermeneutics, he's talking about interpretation and about truth in story. We get into stuff about, uh, uh, we talk about love and mystery and compassion in relationship and about how to interpret the Bible and we talk about the difference between inspiration and, and how it's connected uh, to the incarnation. And um, what about the dialogue between science and religion, and is there one really currently going on? So, um, again, uh, Peter Enns, uh, his book, The Bible Tells Me So, we get into some stuff, uh, some pretty interesting um, notions, and about coming to terms with uh, what he calls narrative progression. So listen up, listen in, enjoy the interview, um, and you know what? The Bible Tells Me So is a great read, Peter Enns. Well, welcome to Face to Face. We are uh, joined again, uh, as I say, pretty much uh, time and time again by a, a really interesting guest. Uh, Peter Enns is with us today. He's a he's a theologian. He's a writer. He's written on hermeneutics. I know that all sounds pretty technical to everybody out there, but I think you're going to really enjoy today's interview. Uh, Peter, thanks for joining us. You bet. Thanks, David. I'm really happy to be here. So you... I've, I've, I've searched your name a few times online, Peter, and okay. uh, I, I have to say the Peter Enns and controversy seem to be synonymous. Is that, in some is that, circles, yeah, in some circles, but small circles, not big ones, and that's fine. Yeah. Is that, is that to do it's with... It's just enough to keep me sort of energetic and wary. Does it but con- not enough to make me preoccupied. You know what I mean? Yeah, so, 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 it, so it, doesn't, it doesn't really bring you down. No. <laughs> And what and what what does some of this controversy have to do with? I mean, I know you're 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 writing on uh, biblical criticism and hermeneutics, and as a yeah. theologian and so on, you've taken some heat from for some of your stances on, I guess, that maybe the dialogue between science and religion, uh, and so on. But but is it is it largely to do with your? Hmm, I was going to use the word attack, but that's not probably not fair. But your criticism of a conservative understanding of the gospel is that a fair question? Well, I'm not sure it's so much the gospel, although I guess that sort of ties in. It's more, um, you know, I wrote this book 10 years ago, Inspiration and Incarnation, and that's where, quote, the controversy started, okay. which I've been able to sustain for 10 years, which has been amazing. <laughs> um, but, uh, yeah, and, and the gist of that book is basically, listen, um, there are a lot of things that biblical scholars simply take for granted and that are true, but that don't sit well with evangelical, standard evangelical, centrist evangelical views of how the Bible works. And we have to think of better ways of addressing these things, and if it means rethinking evangelical ways of looking at the Bible, then so be it. But people are, you know, confused, and I get questions all the time, and, and uh, you know, hermeneutically speaking and, and theologically speaking, it seems that maybe evangelicalism is more about protecting boundaries than it is sort of exploring and trying to address real things that come our way. Well, and yeah, go ahead. in some sense, I was going to say, isn't there kind of uh, a fear of the question in a sense? Um, I, I think the fear is in the answer. I mean, the, hmm. the question is, you know, I, uh, people say we have to we have to be able to ask the questions, and I say that's ten percent of it. The, the ninety percent is the answer you give, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm I'm in pl- I'm in, in you know um, have had intersection with um, what I would say not fundamentalists but sort of mainstream evangelical thinkers and and institutions where they actually are very proud in a good sense of the word proud of saying we can ask any question here, but you can't give any answer. 
that isn't within certain prescribed boundaries. And and every institution has boundaries. There's nothing wrong with that. I have boundaries, right? We all sure, have sure. them. Mm-hmm. But the question is when the boundaries are drawn in such a way that effectively, if I can put this bluntly, remove, removes you from discussions that everyone else is having. Like, for example, the, the, the nature of myth and the Bible. Mm-hmm. You don't talk about that. Even myth's bad. God wouldn't do that. Yep. It's sort of mythic a little bit, but you know, God knows better, or Moses didn't really mean it, and things like that. And um, you know, that's oh, that's, that's, a that's a funny. Really looking to protect something that's hard to protect, I think, in terms of you know a broader academic views of how the Bible works that have been around for hundreds of years. Is that the is that the bumper stuck here on the back of your car? Moses didn't really mean it. <laughs> well, you see, what I mean by that is. Is you know, for example, Genesis chapter one has clear you know ancient Near Eastern mythic overtones um, about waters of chaos and God taming the waters of chaos and things like that. And um, you know, the more progressive evangelicals will say, "Well, listen, this clearly reflects a mythic world." But when Moses is writing this, which is again a part of evangelicalism, Moses is more or less the author of this. But when Moses is writing this, he actually knows that myth isn't true. Right. He's just saying it for the sake of the dumb people who are reading this. Right. 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 That that's how you sort of get out of it. <laughs> it's myth, but we don't. But even the Bible shows that even though it's using myth, myth isn't true. So right. so I've I've had this conversation with my kids. They're they're uh, they're seven and ten, about to both change September November birthdays, which is all wonderful and kind of neat and cool to see how they're growing up with. You know, their dad is a philosopher asking lots of questions, mom right. and dad and Elizabeth and I having lots of conversations and doing our best to include them. And I'm trying to show them that uh, there's a truth in story, that, that, right. that you know, you can, you can read a comic book and still there's lots of truth there. And, yeah. and, and, and yet, you know, trying to, to make that distinction, but I don't know, between small T and capital T truth, I suppose. Right, right. Well, yeah, and I think, you know, I, I agree with you there completely. The question that comes up, though, mm-hmm. which I think can be answered, but the question comes up is, okay, listen, but, you know, truth means thing in the Bible means things like when biblical authors purport to write about a historical event in the past, truth means it's historical. Right. And that doesn't take into account contextualized notions of truth in the ancient world where historical for them might not mean what historical is for us. Right. And they might even be thinking in terms of those categories. Like, you can tell a story saying, so, you know, Abraham went up a mountain with his son Isaac, right? Or, uh, and then he came down, he went this, he went there, and they, they said this and said that. You have narrative uh, progression, which, um, you know, many evangelicals, I mean, good evangelical scholars who, who, who know a lot will say, well, this suggests, more than suggests, this actually requires us to think in terms of historical events because you have a sequence that involves time and space. And I say, well, so does Tolkien. Right. So does anything, so does a comic book. Anything I've ever read has sequence, so that doesn't really help. And, and, and I think, you know, to, 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 to move in that direction really opens you to having to grapple with the power of story in the Bible and, and how that can feed us theologically and not just be a problem to be addressed to keep our theology intact. So I guess, so I'm, I'm, I've got some of my own upbringing here and so on coming, coming to bear on this conversation without a doubt. And I read your book and so loved it, by the way. The Bible tells me so, mm. uh, subtitle, Why Defending Scripture Has Made Us Unable to Read It, which is fascinating to me. So we, we, we grow up in this environment where we're not actually, um, hmm, I make a distinction in my classes. I talk about apprehension and comprehension. So mm. we, we kind of comprehend the text, but we don't really take it in. We, yeah. don't, we don't really embrace it. So so uh, I teach in international development. Well, isn't it lovely that we talk about listening and the other and, and right. responsibility, but if we don't actually do that, mm-hmm. we might know it rationally, but it's two plus two equals four in the classroom, right. but it may not equal four on the ground. Right. And right. and so wow. I, I look at some of what you're saying, and I go, but hang on, Peter, and uh, what do I choose then as true? You know, and mm-hmm. that's got to be the simple criticism that's being leveled against the work that you're doing, right? Um, I, I, yeah, I, think, I do anyway. hear that. You know, where does this stop? Where do, yeah, where do you, where do you, draw, right. you know, the old uh, classic slippery slope stuff, right. you know? Where do where, you draw the line? Where do you draw the line? 
And, you know, I, 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 first of all, on one level, I appreciate the question. I don't, I don't slough it off. I say, yeah. And on one level, my answer is, I don't know. <laughs> right, which is and great. I, and I'm happy with not knowing. Yep. And yep. also, the fact that I don't know where this goes doesn't mean my observation here is therefore false. Good. Okay. Right? Yeah, I can yeah, have the true helpful. observation, and I don't know where it goes because I'm just a person. Well, and you, in other words, on. you still you're still validating that um, that understanding or that perspective, right? By, right? by saying that, yeah, yeah, and, and and I understand. I don't agree with it because, again, I think you know, as a philosopher, you know, hundred times better than I do. We do have to get into issues of what do you mean by truth? And I know that sounds like what Pilate says to Jesus, but I don't mean it that way, right? I mean, what is mm-hmm. truth? I mean, is it lowercase t, capital T? Is it a truth that transcends cultural particularities, or is it truth within culture? Is it a postmodern view, a modernist view? Oh, it's, it's a mess. <laughs> it is a mess, and yeah. I think that, um, you know, it's been said by many people, and the first time I heard it, I, uh, I think I was in graduate school or seminary, and I, I, it just clicked with me how much conservative American, at least, you know, Canadian American, whatever, fundamentalism and, and evangelicalism. Easy there, easy there. I know. Don't equate you guys up Americans. there. Yeah, come on, come on, Peter. With better health care. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> and, and a baseball team that's threatening my Yankees right now, but we won't get into that. Apparently, so, and um, I, don't, I don't follow it, but I, 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 I wanted to go, no kidding, first time in like 32 years to see a baseball game with Spencer and a friend. We yeah. can't actually get tickets. They're sold out. I know, yeah. It seats yeah. 55,000 people. Like Figure that out. Yeah, it's insane, yeah. Well, but let's be careful about that. Go to a radio, right? What else do you in Canada but go to a radio or... That's, oh, oh here we go. I yeah. don't know. What else, what, what else, I mean, I can't think of any... Anyway. <laughs> that was, a low, in the wrong that was a low blow, but I'll... And uh, I actually lost your question in the midst of all this yeah, rambling. So, okay. Yeah, I have no <laughs> idea what we were talking oh, about. We were talking about modern, modernist notions of truth, postmodernist notions of truth. And, and uh, you know, I've heard this critique of evangelicalism you know, for, for many, many years. Mm-hmm. I think it's absolutely true that... We're dealing here with a modernist notion of truth. Yes. That it's accessible, you know, it's somewhat reductionistic, and it's what can be analyzed, assessed, and understood. It has to be logical, it has to be, you know, consistent. Um, uh, it's based in time space reality, well, you have so called and, facts. And, and, and you ha- exactly, so called facts, and you have to be able to measure it right. in some way. And, right. And that makes me crazy. When, when, when I hear yeah. that, you know, it, it, it's reducible to some sort of proposition. It's a statement. It's, which is, I think, what we do with a text like the Bible all the time. We try to reduce it right. to statements about the world, which mm-hmm. I think is essentially what you're sort of saying in the Bible tells me so, that hang mm-hmm. on, context is everything here. Right. We've got to talk about, about it historically, and it might actually change what it's telling us today. And... The real, th- I mean, I think I understand why this is threatening because what you're essentially telling people then is your doctrine of scripture upon which you base your theology is not really a solid foundation. It's, it's a factor in the discussion. Yeah. But it's not the solid foundation that we know. Well, first of all, you've got to start with the Bible and you have to exegete it. Oh, that's easy. And let's move on to step two. That's the problem. Yeah. You know, what does it mean to understand these texts? Yeah. And, and then, heaven help us, you know, when we have to, and, and all Christians do this, when we, I guess, systematize the text, and, and we have portions of it speaking to each other. And if we make assumptions that, you know, well, since God wrote this, it's going to be completely consistent, then you're obligated to demonstrate that consistency. It gets really, really messy. It gets difficult. And, and you know, and, and if that's sort of the, the, the doctrine of Scripture that you're saying you must start and end here, some people will say... Others will leave. Right. Right? And, well, and, on, and on I wonder some, why. And people keep leaving. You know? Well, I think on some, on some level, it, the, the whole, the foundation seems to crumble. But I think this is to your point about the modernist notion of truth. And I think this is a perfect place to bring in the fact that you're writing a new book called, uh, which is coming out hopefully in the new year, uh, called The Sin of Certainty. Mm-hmm. And I didn't quite get the subtitle from you, but uh, why, why God prefers that we trust... I'll let you finish it. Yeah, well, okay, we're just, actually, we just finalized it a days ago. Why God prefers that we trust him more than think correctly about him. Right. And the gist is basically this, thinking is fine, seeking after correct thinking is fine, but a preoccupation with thinking correctly about God gets in the way of trusting God, which is the dominant, I think, biblical metaphor yeah. for how you relate to... Pe- 
the higher power. P- Peter, do, do we have to be right? Is that what this really comes down to? I mean, is that what we're fighting over here really? You know, uh, <sighs> scholarly, relationally, that it's about pride, it's about arrogance, it's about, no, no, hang on, or, or is it about fear? I mean, it's... I think it's, it's fear, yeah. I mean, I, that, I, I do think, and, it's fe- and I'm very adamant about that because I've seen it in myself. It's not mm-hmm. just an observation that I have to the outside, but it's my own thinking, it's my own movement in my mind and how I think about my faith and all that. Fear makes us do all sorts of things. And, you know, a good way to allay fear is to say, I have a book that's given to me by God. You're not going to question it. Right. 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 And I say, great, let me read that book. And I say, well, wait a minute. There are two different histories of Israel in the Old Testament, and they don't jive. Mm Hmm. What kind of a God are we dealing with? See, and that's to me the bottom line. It's the Bible gives us, the Bible read a certain way gives us a certain kind of God. Right, interesting. Yeah. And that's, I yeah. think, what's really behind it. It's yeah, like, sure. I, if I can't trust the Bible, then I can't trust God. That's right. Yeah. Which, again, comes back to this whole idea of propositional truth. The truth right. is to be found in the statement. And that's so not what myth and what story. And frankly, isn't it? I mean, this is where I think, um, as a philosopher who now is working in development, and, uh, and I go, hang on a second. This is where this stuff really makes contact with reality. This is right. not just stuff that we do in a classroom. Right. This is going right. to make all the difference in how we raise our kids and how yeah. we teach in our schools, especially in, in, in theological seminaries, it seems right. to me. But isn't it about truth and authenticity and being, and being more relational and being more open, mm-hmm. I guess? Well, if, if you believe in this, that certainty is a sin, you must believe in a, a, an open structure of a sort. Well, I mean, I've, I've come to that, and, yeah. you know, the title is Sin of Certainty. I sort of explain what I mean by that. It's just it, it sells God short. Yeah. Huh. It sure. elevates our rational capacities and it misses so much of what the Bible's doing in that sense. Do you think, do you think Peter, if you had been around, I don't know, let's say a couple hundred years ago, we wouldn't have an angry atheistic movement today. Would they be a little more open to some of the things that. That's a good question. Yeah. I mean, in other words, was atheism sort of forced more or less the the way we have it because it's our, because of the stringency of, correct. Yeah. It's, it's like when I look at, uh, and I've been, I've been sort of having some fun at, at Christopher Hitchens and Dawkins' expense and so on of late. But, but when we look at that response to what uh, we're talking about, I don't know that it's really the content. I think it's what we've done with the content that, that really yeah. is making a lot of these guys angry and upset. I think that that's a lot um, to it. There's a lot to that. And um, I would add that there is, I think, a content portion of that from the people I know, some of whom very close to me are, you know, functionally atheistic or like hyper agnostics who have right. come out of an evangelical background because the content of the paradigm, it's not just what they've done with it, but it's the content of the paradigm has for them ceased giving them any sort of explanatory power of the world that they live in. Right. If, 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 if what you're saying has to be the way it is, I'm looking around me. And I don't know how to live anymore in this world with that paradigm. So you're not you're not saying, I guess I guess to to some degree I guess some of the the concern around some of the things you're saying is well you know at what point do I throw the text out and start over? That's not what you're saying at all. No, not at all. You don't throw the text out. The text is the text. The text is scripture. And, you know, a point that I try to make in, in, you know, the book you kindly mentioned, The Bible Tells Me So, also known as The Yellow Book. <laughs> you have to wear sunglasses to take it off the shelf. Um, right. Yeah, so, you know, the, the point that I make there is that, you know, the, the, the Bible, see, if you think of the Bible, and I use these metaphors which are sort of catchy and, you know, not to be taken too woodenly, but uh, the Bible is sort of a, uh, a rule book a right. Christian owner's manual or a cookbook. You sort of like put all the pieces together and poof, you've got this perfect Christian or you know exactly what God's will is. I think, you know, if, if you think of the Bible that way, yeah, then actually your only option is to stay there or throw it out. Right. Because right. you won't have something else in between. But I try to suggest that the Bible itself doesn't even let you have that as an option, the cookbook mentality. Right? It, doesn't even, it doesn't allow you to have it because it's too diverse, it's too messy. It's like it couldn't be clearer. So what is the Bible? Well, it's not a cookbook, it's not an owner's manual. It's actually modeling for us, 
using ancient language, ancient categories, uh, what it means to be on a spiritual journey with God, and here's what it looks like. And you know what? There are ups and downs. There are times when it seems like you pretty much are clear what God is up to. See, to me, to me, as I listen to you, I just go, and, and of course your critics are just going to, if they're even listening to this, they're just going to go, oh, make me sick. But there, to me, that sounds like there's a, there's, a, there's a humility to that, that says, and this is, I think, where I've direct, where, why I asked you the question about, you know, a couple hundred years and the atheist today. There's a humility that says, you know what? I don't know. Right. right. There's a mystery here. You know, what is the phrase? I wrote down a phrase here. E- e- your fr- I think it's your phrase. Eavesdropping on an ancient spiritual yeah. journey. Right? right. Beautiful. Yeah. Lovely phrase. I yeah. love that, Peter. So, so, I mean, doesn't that kind of imply that how the heck would I possibly ever get it all right? Yeah. Well, I hope it's humility. Um, I can imagine there's a, there could be an arrogance behind that. Like, you know, I know more than you that we can't know this. I've spent way more time things. in the classroom than you. Ha, ha, ha. Yeah, right. Yeah. I don't want to you know, play that game, but I think, yeah. see, along with that, there is a humility, but you know what? There are also two other things, and you know, one is courage. It, it's actually it's hard to do that. Mm. It, it takes courage, and, I, and that's, you know, I'm not suggesting that I'm a courageous person. I just know that sometimes it's hard to not know and to continue trusting God. Right. Even if God makes no sense whatsoever. Right. You know, even if you're like in the words of Psalm 89, God's basically a liar because he said he would never, ever turn his back on David and his dynasty. And then you have the exile. Right. And he turned his back on David and his dynasty. And he's had the psalmist grappling with that. I'm like, that's what I want in my Bible. Okay. So, so maybe not humility. I'm just hanging on that. How about humanity? Yeah, well, there's more humility is fine. Humanity, I humanity, think you know, it's like authenticity, honesty. Auth- yeah, exactly, yeah. authenticity. And I think when I when I go to church, when I when I read a lot of authors, when I see people on TV speaking about religion in one form or another, I don't sense that humanity. We've we've we we've, we've detached ourselves from it in a very sorry about this guys out there platonic way. We've taken a lot yeah. of Greek thought and and Plato and basically said truth's out there somewhere. Eventually right. we're going to get to it. Oh, and by the way, this Bible is a really great way to get there. Right. And right. and oh, actually, some of us are saying just take it off the shelf and you've got access to it right there. And I right. think I don't know. I just see a real danger in that and a lack of humanity ar- around me when I get into a conversation after a relatively, um, uh, for, for, I was going to say relatively, uh, from a local, ch- a local church service, you know, yeah. there's a, there's a concern about what's sad. There's a re- it's hard, you know, if somebody was to use the word shit in that conversation, and mm-hmm. I probably just alienated half of our listeners, it, mm-hmm. it creates, it creates, um, hmm, a barrier. Immediately. Right. And I go, hang on a second here. There's a, there's a humanity to that. That's really honest right. and open. You know? Right, and again, if you want humanity, read the Bible. So that, that's the irony. There, there is. Well, it is an irony. Yeah, yeah. It's not false piety. It's, it's actually. Now you do have, you know, the do as I say kind of priestly stuff. You know, and 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 you got Paul coming down on people. You have that, but you know, it's it's such a big mixed bag where there's clearly an internal dialogue, which is something that I think you know the the world of Judaism more or less has done a much better job of than the world of Christianity more or less, and recognizing that and and sort of struggling with these diverse and divergent parts of Scripture, and trying to make sense of them, and how you even listen to Scripture when your context has changed so much. Right. That right. the Bible and what it's assuming about, like, for example, you're in the land, you know, and you're actually Jewish, and the Gentiles are the people on the outside, right? I mean, those kinds of assumptions started, you know, being more difficult to maintain once the Israelites were booted out of the land and then came back, and then A.D. 70 with the, the sack of Jerusalem by the Romans, and then the, you know, the, the, the expulsion from, from their own land and not really to return again until the 1940s. You know, you had to think of a different way of accessing your Bible, mm-hmm. which required tremendous creativity and not just being propositional about it. You had to get really interesting hermeneutically in terms of what it meant to access this text. And I think that's, that's, that's lost on, on Christians very much, at least in the conservative realm. Right. Do, do you care... 
Uh, does no, it matter? That's question. You? That's right. No, period. Yeah. Bold and italics. Uh, <laughs> d- stories. The stories in the Old Testament, the stories in the New Testament, does it matter to you if they are, in fact, um, if they, sorry, I was going to say true, and that's not right, but if they, in fact, actually happened the way it's laid out? Um, I guess the short answer is no. Um, but I've sort of, I guess, learned to come to that point of view over many years. Mm-hmm. So I, do, I don't just, like, throw that in people's faces, and I very yeah. much yeah. respect where people are, you know, especially teaching college students. You know, I don't yeah. expect them to be 54 and, and, and um, cranky like I am. Right. You know, I right. just, I, I, they're right. young, and, and, and they have their place, and their spiritual location is what it is, and God is real there. But I see. I'd be contradicting myself. I said you have to arrive at my notion of truth, right? Of course you would, in yeah. order to be accessing God. Yeah. Yeah. God doesn't pay attention to people like me when I talk like that, right? Right. But I have things, as do many, many other people, that things you... that we want to talk about that others really are struggling with, and saying they're at that point where they're saying, "Listen, if I have to believe that everything in Genesis happened more or less as we read it in time and space." then I can't be a Christian anymore because right. I don't think that's true. Okay, you know what? People have talked about that for a long time. What do you, and then what do you do with the people on the other side? And I'm sorry for being so divisive here, but I, yeah. I know some folks who say, oh, you know, without Josh McDowell, uh, without the, you know, um, the case for Christ approach, you know, this mm-hmm. evidentialist kind of yeah. two plus two equals four approach, I wouldn't have been, become, I wouldn't have become a Christian. Right. And because they proved to me that this was a good thing or mm-hmm. that this was the way forward. Right. Well, I guess on, on one level, like, I don't seek out people like that to engage and tell them they're wrong. <laughs> good you know, good I call. Don't. Yeah. No, I really, I just, I mean, the, <laughs> they're fun. where they are, but I think, yeah. you know, I've yeah. had this conversation with people, and I, I say, I don't doubt for one minute that you're right, that mm. this is your entryway into right. the faith. Right. Now, right. that doesn't mean you stay there. Right. Right. But, but, you know, but are you saying, like, 20 years down the road, I might disagree with everything I thought? 20 years earlier. Well, not everything, but maybe a lot of it. Well, in like a way, you, you kind of when hope. you're 25 instead of five. Well, in a, and in a way, you kind of hope. It's kind of like, I remember reading somebody, I don't know who it was, it might have been uh, C.S. Lewis for all I know, but somebody that said, you know, it was Thomas Merton, write something, publish it, file it, whatever it is you do, and move on. Yeah. Because in 10 years or three or two, you're going to look back and go, wow, I can't believe I thought that or believed it. And the right. beauty is you've actually grown and you've matured. And Right. I really took that kind of to heart. It, it changed the way I approached uh, what I say and what I do right. and how I teach and what I write and so on. Right. And see, we can change because we're people. We're just limited contextual beings, you know, albeit with, you know, a cerebral cortex. We can do all sorts of abstract thinking. But, you know, we, we are only, I, I think we, one day we may be surprised. <laughs> how much we simply don't know, <laughs> and, how, and how much we assume that what we good. know is actually universally. Yeah, valid. it's good. You know, and 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 I think you know if that see that is a position of humility, which can also be a frightening position if you're coming out of sort of a you, you got to know what you believe mentality, and the Bible tells you. Yeah. I know that's frightening and it's yeah. difficult, but you know maybe there is a bigger god to be found there where we let go of our need to be right well what i'd like to think there is a there's a more relational god there's a more human god i want to i want to start hearing more about that and what does it actually mean how does that change the way i love my wife or raise my kids mm-hmm. or how how i interact with yeah. the global south or whatever it is and that's right. sort of the work uh, where where i land um how does yeah. it affect the average and the ordinary and the everyday and right. if it's not then then in a sense it is kind of meaningless it seems and, and you know, I think, see, the Bible shouts that very thing to us loud and clear, but not on the propositional level. Right, good. But I think yeah, on yeah. the broader global level sure. where, you know, this is why I think the incarnation is an important concept in sure. Christianity. Sure. Of course, <laughs> you yeah. know, I yes. don't understand yeah. it, I can't yeah. define yeah. it, don't get into Christology, I don't want to talk about it, okay? I just, but I'm saying the idea of incarnation is so fundamental that God is relational, you know, to use the other word, covenantal, in yeah, the Bible. Yeah, sure. Yeah. That's, fun, that's fundamental, and you can see that covenantal relationship, that incarnational um, manifestation of God in different circumstances, when you see biblical writers disagreeing about what God requires. 
or what, about what God do, is up to. Do you think that's one of the things that makes Christianity kind of distinctive from other religions? I know other writers have said things like, you know, grace is what's really distinctive. You know, most religions don't have, you know, an understanding of grace. But do mm-hmm. you think it's that humanity of God? I mean, a lot of religions have an incarnation. You know, yeah. God comes down and, and sort of uh, is humanized to some yeah. degree. But right. I, I think, you know, when you look at, uh, uh, you know, what Paul Young has done with the shack, what James Torrance right. has done with right. some of his Trinitarian theology and the Torrances and, and Baxter Kruger, the great dance and, and, and you and others, I think there's a filiancy. I think there's a humanity sort of bubbling to the surface that you don't necessarily see in other religions, but wondered, wondered where you stand on that. Well, I, I think so. You know, what I, um, sort of sometimes mentioned when it comes up is, you know, what makes Christianity distinct? And, you know, the word incarnation does come to my mind sure. immediately. And again, I'm not claiming to define it or really understand it, but I don't, I mean, you correct me if I'm wrong. And I, I, I've looked, and maybe I'm just not smart enough to look in the right places. I've actually been writing down all the places where you're wrong, actually, in this conversation, Peter. So I'll well, be able that to, can't be. Again, I'll, I'll, have my assist, I'll have my assistant forward that to you. One of those little <laughs> tiny post-it notes <laughs> would fit on, probably, right? That's right. Um, yeah, but <laughs> anyway, you know, I think at least one element that I can't find any place is a religion that... Where you know, short, shorthand way of putting it, God is crucified. Mm, mm, where, mm. where God enters into humiliation and suffering. Where you know, I just read. Um, oh gosh, what the heck was his name? Um, Martin Hengel, right? He's got a, a wonderful little book on what crucifixion meant mm. in the first century. It's actually it's a, it's a collection of a couple of essays. It's like you know, hundred pages long. But um, you know, the the abject humiliation and offense of crucifixion of the first century. You've got to be crazy to have a religion that says, you know, that God is somehow manifest in this Galilean Jew right. who's killed in, 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 a, um, in a way that is only for traitors and robbers and basically the scum of society. Now, if Christianity is true, right, if God is real, if God exists and Christianity is true, what kind of a God are we talking about here? Right. Right. And I, I'm fascinated by that, you know, and it drives me. And I think that's like, I, I don't know if I can talk like that. I think you can talk like that in t- with respect to Judaism, but a different kind of incarnational element, which is the stories of the Old Testament where God participates in the, the cultural categories of the time, which is why you have laws from Mount Sinai telling you rules about how to and how not to beat your slaves. Right. I don't think God actually advocates that, but I think he's fine with, you know, the way I put it in the book, you know, he lets his children tell the story from their point of view where they are, and we can learn something from that. But propositionally, we don't just sort of put that in our belt and say, well, there's another thing I have to do or believe in, you know, so to speak. So, What do you, what do you find is one of the things that um, people find most unsettling about what you're trying to say? Um, if you know, we well, kind of talked around it, I think. We've talked about fear, yeah. and we've talked about this uh, notion of certainty and so on, which is really rationalism and so on. Right. But, but is there something sort of on the surface Is it uh, that, that actually is really just a symptom of a greater problem? Yeah, well, I think, you know, the symptom is that I can't trust the Bible anymore. Mm. Um, and, you know, then we have to talk about, are we supposed to be trusting the Bible, or are we supposed to be trusting right. God? You know, right. that kind of thing. But I think, you know... The way, you know, our, our faith provides for us a narrative, and no one likes their narrative being rewritten, because, <laughs> right. and I don't, I mean, who right. does, sure, right? I mean, sure. I'm not out there saying, I don't have a narrative, you people don't, you know? I, I don't like, I don't like my, and my narrative's been rewritten more than once, and it's very uncomfortable. It can drive you to depression, to, you know, just being, leave me alone. I don't right. know how to process the world anymore, and I think that fear is understandable, but, see, I lay the blame. <laughs> it's not the Bible, it's not Christianity, but it's, you know, reactive mode to 18th, 19th century stuff that happened in the Western world where, you know, the gospel was threatened because new things were being discovered that threatened old ways of thinking. Right. And people's worlds were flipping in five different directions. In just the 19th century, you got evolution, you have 
German and, and French and British historical higher criticism that talks about, you know, Moses did not write the Pentateuch, I'm sorry. You know, it, it, it was compiled a thousand years after Moses would have lived if he lived. Right, right. right. So you have the Bible being taken apart, you've got evolution, and you've got biblical archaeology, right. which is saying, you know, the Babylonians live way before the Israelites, and they have stories that look similar. So this was weird. <laughs> you know, so you don't have the uniqueness where God sort of pops down this knowledge that nobody else had. It's adapting stories of other cultures and sort of reshaping them theologically. And, and when you do that, when you have those three things happening, that's where Bible colleges came from. Right. That's where Bible seminaries came from. That's where, you know, the scope monkey trial comes from. And, and, and you know, that's very much part of the conservative DNA, and it's passed down faithfully generation to generation through churches and through schools. And, you know, I think th- that is the cultural issue that won't be one in debate. It has to be won by modeling something different for that critical mm. mass that is ready to hear it. Well, I was just going to say, is there a sense in which others will start listening more to the church, to the West, to the... Uh, and you could you could talk about politics here, too. We could talk about all kinds of things, culturally, I suppose, as well. But for, for we, we have to say, hang on a second here, we may have been wrong after all. <laughs> You're asking a lot of people to say our narrative is wrong. You know, right? <laughs> well, I, mean, I guess in a, I guess in a way I am, yeah. Or yeah. or maybe not wrong, but just said, hey, you know what? I don't. You know, it's okay not to have all the answers. Right. And I think that's what I may regret teaching my kids uh, one right. day. But I think I think we're going to have kids that are going to put their dukes up one day. But I hope and I trust that it's going to be in a in a in a what did you say narratively progressive way? You talked about narrative so. progression, yeah. you know, and and being right. sensitive to this mystery and wonder that says, right. "Hang on a minute here." And I think this, Peter, isn't this our humanity? Aren't I just saying to you, "Yeah, you know what? I don't know. It's messy. You know, right. politics is messy. Sex is messy. You know, yeah. these things are messy there, and it's okay." And, and maybe God is not about tidying things up right. and putting things in their place. But you see, here's the problem, David. The Bible opens up with God puts things in their place. Mm. There is only male or female. There's nothing in between. There's right. only light or day. There's no dawn or dusk. There's, you know, these, right. you know, right. there right. are land animals, there are sea right. animals. There's Greek, nothing Greek, in the middle. Greek dualism right out of the gate. Right. You know, it's sort of a, this binary view mm-hmm. of reality, which now why is that? Well, you know what? Because... You know, in the ancient world, you have priestly classes, and one of the things they're concerned about, especially Israelite priests, are clean and unclean, you know, things in their place, and that's how you authentically, genuinely express devotion to your God, Mm. right? And I say that's fantastic, but I think there are actually amphibians. Mm. I don't think they're just land animals or sea animals, and I, I, I don't blame... See, to me, Genesis 1 isn't wrong. It's ancient. Mm, and uh, what's nice. their theology? What are they trying to say? Right, Why are they right, trying to say right. it? What do we keep? What do we pass on? What do we leave behind? Well, our, and really now we're just talking context, right? Right. Context um, is huge. Um, what did you say? Genesis 1 isn't wrong. It's ancient. It's ancient. Yeah. You and know, I want to learn from that in terms of, okay, <clears throat> why are they writing what they're writing? And what can I take with me and learn from that in terms of how I do theology. You know, we, I hate to say this, but we got to wrap this up and, and okay. uh, we're going to have to do part two. And I think what's funny about uh, my, the, I, I do, I do, uh, I do a lot of podcasting face to face and I've interviewed about 110 people now. And I think everyone that I've interviewed, I've, I've opened it with, got an interesting person I'm talking to here and we get to the <laughs> end and I say, Hey, would you come back and do a part two? Because yeah. <laughs> it ju- I just talk about scratching the surface. It's insane. It just, it yeah. makes, it makes me crazy, but I do need to know why you picked the color yellow for the title of the book, The Bible Tells well, I didn't. Me so. Oh, okay. No, I mean, I'm sort of glad. I mean, I got one email from um, a friend of mine who's done a lot of writing who also has a couple of yellow books. And she <laughs> said, welcome to the Yellow Book Club. It's so you funny. Know? It, it is sort of a thing. You know, you yeah. want it to stand out, and, and I'm just getting the cover designs for the next book. Right. We're looking at them right. and saying, which one do we want to have? Yeah. 
Um, a little dusty rose, perhaps, or right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't think so. Yeah, you know. Well, listen. Thank you so much for joining sure. us today. So you've got a blog. It's uh, Pete Enns, and that's P E T E E N N S dot com. Right. Check it yeah. out. It's we've got uh, books. The Bible for Normal People is the subtitle. I'm looking at it right here, uh, right now. You've got a new book coming out called The Sin of Certainty, probably in the new year. Is that right? That's gonna, probably in the spring. I'm going to say like March, April. Excellent. Well, yeah. Listen, Peter, thank you so much for uh, joining us today. Really appreciate Thanks. it. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you.